Welcome everybody to Radicalized Truth Survives, episode 83. Today we are bringing back our very good friend, Zarina Zabriskie. She is reporting from Kherson in Ukraine. She's an author, a poet, a war correspondent, and she is bringing us an incredible tutorial today about hybrid warfare. So please share this with everybody you know. Nothing is more important than actually getting people to understand how their minds are being hacked and to what end. Please watch this Hybrid Warfare 101 tutorial and please share. Zarina Zabriskie, we are so happy to have you back with us. Thank you for being with us again here today. Our friends know you as an author and a poet and now a war correspondent. I just listened to Paul Conroy's latest podcast and I got to say, the work that you're doing is just so incredibly, incredibly important. Before we jump into our information warfare tutorial from you, can you please let us know where you are and how you are? Yes. Hi, Heidi, uh, Jim, uh, George. It's so good to see you. So good to see and hear everyone in the audience. Thank you so much for choosing um, and finding time to be with us. Uh, the hybrid war, disinformation warfare, uh, incredibly uh, important subjects right now. You cannot overestimate the importance. Even for me, uh, being in the hot war zone, I'm in a front line city of Kherson, about one mile from um, the adversary, which is the Russian uh, invaders on the other side of the Dnipro River. They pummel the city of Kherson day and night with artillery fire, aerial bombs, um, mortar, pretty much anything they can come up with, including uh, the um, weapons that are uh, the use of which on civilians are against the uh, any kind of conventions. And this is cluster munition um, and um, chemical weapons and so forth. But I am committing the time uh, to address the hybrid war again and disinformation warfare again, because it's simply the part of the whole package. Uh, so I will start with a very brief one minute video of my surrounding and the environment. Uh, and this is how the hot war looks. Here I am back. It's strangely beautiful and so empty and so destroyed. The air raid starts the moment you step out. Paul and I are planning to report as long as we can, film, send daily updates on Twitter to cover brave, heroic people of your son. Please join us. Thank you. What I see when I step out of my building, the air raids go pretty much around the clock, uh, but for the artillery fire, we don't get any. We just get the artillery fire. Now, I have been the war reporter for the last two years, since the start of the full-scale Russian invasion in Ukraine. However, I have been reporting on this war on the hybrid part of this war since 2014. And this is just a logical continuation. That's what the hybrid war eventually becomes. And today we will address the psychological part of it and the information, or is it often referred to, disinformation warfare. Uh, I have been teaching seminars 
uh, on the Russian, uh, the Kremlin propaganda and narratives, uh, starting in 2016, when I was trying to bring the attention of the Western audience to this phenomenon. Uh, at the time, there was some attention. I managed to get classes going in San Francisco, New York, London, uh, but it certainly failed to gain the attention and to get the proper amount of response uh, that was needed. So as the result, we are having the hot war now. To avoid the consequences for us in the future, we need to pay attention to it. So I'm using the presentation that I have created in around 2017, and strangely enough, it all stands. Wow. Here we go, I have a PowerPoint presentation. We'll be talking today about hybrid war and disinformation. Uh, just very briefly uh, about me, I used to be a writer and now I'm just a war correspondent and a hybrid war uh, reporter. Uh, how do I know about hybrid war and propaganda? Well, I studied languages and literatures at LGU, which uh, reads as Leningrad St State University in the USSR. Why did I then study propaganda? because I was forced to take a course of what was called combat propaganda at the time. If I did not take the course, I wouldn't be able to study and I wouldn't be able to get my degree. Um, the officers were trained to work with the army and population of the enemy. It was classified information and very few had to take it. Uh, but because I studied the English language and literature, I was obliged to take it. Well, frequently I am asked, why could you just say no? Because that was a different reality. Uh, that was the USSR where you had to do certain things to leave. Uh, for instance, uh, just very recently, I was talking to two Polish teenagers uh, who go to Europe to make, uh, to, to the, I mean, they are Europe, but they go to Western Europe somewhere, say in France, to collect strawberries to make some money. Uh, well, we had to work at the collective farms for months, uh, sometimes for three months for free. It was unpaid and it was compulsory. And you could not not go as a child, as a school ch uh, child, um, because uh, that's just the reality of the communist totalitarian country. We also had to take elementary military preparation classes uh, in school, uh, learn the communist party of the Soviet Union history, Leninist Marxism, and so our uh, combat propaganda was just a part of the program. Uh, we did have some manuals and textbooks. However, they were classified and we never got to hold any in our hands. Uh, in fact, we were writing in the textbooks that at the end of the class, we were surrounded and they were all going in the big safe. Um, and I spoke about it often. There are some funny anecdotes, but I'm not going to go into it right now. So right now you are seeing the cover of one of the manuals and the description of it um, is the information of the main area of secret operations of hybrid warfare, of which basic elements include disinformation, lobbying, manipulation, blackmail, and crisis management. Uh, at the time, it was a laughing matter to us because we had to do things like writing pamphlets uh, that I remember had uh, sentences like American soldier, surrender, you are surrounded, or what brought you here, brother, or the classic one, while you are rotting in trenches, a billionaire is kissing your girlfriend. So we laughed then. Um, now it's not as funny. Uh, you see right now on your screens, a screenshot, sorry for tautology, uh, a screenshot from a song that Putin used for his previous presidential election theme. Uh, it literally sounded translated from Russian as Uncle Vova wants Alaska, I kid you not. 
and um, the children are singing a bunch of songs like this. Uh, currently, basically, the whole country of Russia is marching uh, to military themes. Uh, what happened, the Russian government created the myth of a foreign invasion threat. It's a narrative of a fortress, surrounded fortress. Um, so the country uh, at the time was about to start the war, but nobody was listening to that. Uh, so how did it happen that the Russian population is brainwashed to the degree that uh, this uh, invasion, full-scale invasion of Ukraine is possible and basically virtually no protests are happening in Russia. It's not just the mechanism of suppression. It's really the extreme brainwashing uh, that uh, the Putin's government was working on for uh, over 20 years. Uh, the Russian-controlled TV uh, was broadcasting the uh, videos of um, different conflicts, creating the danger situation. And we'll talk about it during this presentation. Uh, there was a, a talk of uh, Russia uh, as a victorious empire, uh, and Putin himself was warning uh, and telling the population about the forthcoming uh, military operation, as they call the war. So here the logical question is, why would Putin or anybody else at this matter want war? Well, it's an old principle, uh, unite the country uh, behind an imagined external enemy to distract from domestic problems. It's a classic principle. Uh, as for Russia, its economy suffered greatly under the impact of the Western sanctions after Putin's 2014 annexation of Crimea, and we will talk about it more. Uh, and as I have mentioned, creating a myth of ongoing war is necessary for Putin to stay in power. Uh, there's also the whole theme of a mafia state and uh, the uh, oil and gas money that it gets from the stolen resources from the people, uh, which are used to support the hybrid war. Uh, but uh, we'll not have time to revisit the mafia state. We have discussed mafia state on red pot shows before, and I have a lot of materials on the mafia state. So for anybody who is interested, we will have a link in the comments uh, to read on about the definition and the mechanism mode of operandi uh, of mafia state. Uh, what is the Western response uh, to the Russian actions? Not very impressive response so far. This is a slide that I prepared in 2016. It was oblivion, denial, and confusion. Uh, right now in 2024, it's pretty much still the same. It's certainly not enough to confront the Kremlin uh, uh, offensive. Now, what is a hybrid war? First of all, we need to define it. It is a type of war that blends in a military intervention, the one that I'm experiencing right now, and the information and cyber warfare. So basically the whole world is weaponized and becomes a battlefield. Uh, it is a battle and the aspect that we are going to focus on today is the psychological warfare, and we can call it a mind war. So basically the human mind becomes the battlefield in this war. And I really like this uh, phrase that I came to with he or she or they who wins the thought wins the war. It is incredibly important. So 
uh, there are different type of definition. At the time when I was preparing these seminars, uh, I really like uh, this book by J.J. Patrick. He's an uh, Irish, I believe, author. Um, his book, Alternative War, should be available on Amazon. Uh, and he spoke about the situation in which parties refrain from overt use of armed forces against each other, relying instead on a combination of military intimidation, falling short of an attack, exploitation of economic and political vulnerabilities, and the deployment of diplomatic technologies, means technological means to pursue their objectives. A good example was and is uh, the annexation of Crimea, which is a part of Ukraine, by Russia. So before uh, Russia technically annexed Ukraine, there was a lot of propaganda targeting the population of Crimean Peninsula coming through the Russian television, radio, newspapers, and social media. Uh, then, People uh, without uh, Russian um, indication of them belonging to the Russian army appeared one fine morning in, uh, in February in Crimea. And right after that, Russia called the referendum, one its, of its favorite hybrid war tools. Uh, the referendum was totally fake. Results were falsified. As a result, Crimea was then annexed by Russia. Russia denied that it had any presence or any troops on the ground in Crimea until it stopped denying it and acknowledged it. Uh, and that was the beginning of the hot conflict of the full-scale invasion that we are seeing in Ukraine right now. So the role of cyberspace in a hybrid war cannot be underestimated. Internet, the internet becomes a weapon for creating and spreading myths. Uh, in this uh, cyberspace, the Kremlin launches a myth, so you can refer to it as a narrative. For example, Crimea is ours. That was a hashtag, that was a slogan, and it manipulates the collective mind of the Russian population and also of the Western population, the global population. Uh, and thus, the human mind becomes a battlefield, both on the collective and individual level. Uh, now there are different strategies in the hybrid war, uh, conventional and unconventional war. What is unconventional war? There are influence operations, it could be assassinations or discreditations of political leaders, coup d'etat, terrorist attacks, cyber attacks are used a lot. We see in it these days in Ukraine and not only in Ukraine. Hacking and leaks, uh, formation of militia and militarized brigades, which we still see in the United States, uh, and a lot of in cyber attacks on infrastructure, such as power grids, water contamination, healthcare system, nuclear power station, and so forth. So here, here we can just reinforce that a hybrid war replaces a standard war and adds to the standard war. And the psychosphere becomes the theater of conflict. I like this little picture here, not for its artistic qualities, but for the concept, because the war is in the mind. What are the basic methods of cyberware? This is a concept that is not that transparent or easy to take, but it is very important. If you take one thing back home, from this talk, that should be it. This is the basic way to brainwash individuals and the collective mind. Psychological influence creates emotional stress by using the excitement of all senses. And we will talk about it more to explain it and to illustrate it. But a good example here is 
watching catastrophes and crisis situation and wars on the TV or on the internet all the time. You become stressed. So the propagandists use language as a tool. There are emotive words that have a certain way to trigger your mind. Uh, and these words become inflammatory. And we will talk about it in more detail. For now, I just want you to get the general idea of the basic method of cyber war. So stress, confusion, and discord lead to the demoralization of the society. Information then offered at the time of stress is engineered to relieve this stress. So this could be a, a message of economy booming or unemployment is being down or criminals being caught or just something generally good, feel good information. And by offering this feel good information, the propagandists build the trust to the source of information. And there is um, a, a phenomenon which is called the identification with the aggressor that is now created. So all of this is happening on a subconscious level. We don't know that it's happening, but our brain is wired this way. We were in a really bad situation. We were suffering and now we are offered a solution. The person, the source offering the solution is now perceived as good and trustworthy. And now whatever the new information coming from the source is accepted readily based on this trust. It's a very complex and simple concept at the same time. And it's critical to understand it, uh, to see how it works. What it does, it changes the individual and collective narratives. And these changes lead to the changes in the political landscape of the society. So let's look at it a bit closer. Who are the people who do this work? Well, in Russia, there is a profession which is widely known. Everybody knows it just as a plumber or a teacher or a conductor is called a political technologist. I'm sure most of you have never heard of such a profession because it does not exist in the United States or in the European Union. So political technologists develop sophisticated techniques based on psychology, history, and cultural and linguistic studies. And that's what they were trying to teach us at the Leningrad State University. They went for journalists. That's what they were trying to teach us at this classified course. And that's what political technologists do. Uh, the course was taught to philologists, people who study languages and literature, and journalists. It was called, again, combat propaganda, course, sometimes they refer to it as black propaganda. So what exactly is it? It is the art of sowing discord in the ranks of the enemy by means of disinformation and manipulation of consciousness according to the manual. How do they do that? How can you achieve such a goal? Well, combat propagandists work with the myths embedded in people's minds because we all think in myths, in narratives. We operate in stories. And combat propaganda aggressively opposes those who try to challenge their myths by using logical arguments. And that is because the part of the brain responsible for critical thinking is affected through the basic method application, which we just described. Let's look at it a bit closer. What are the combat propaganda's main goals and methods? Well, main goal is the demoralization 
of the army and population of the enemy achieved by manipulating human mind under stress. The word to focus here is stress. Next, by planting discord using divide and conquer methods, discord is a key word here, and creating confusion. So the key word here is confusion. Let's go through these four keywords again so you can take it home. The main goal is demoralization. So morale is down. Why? Because the number one critical factor for the victory in the war is morale. It's the morale of the army and the population. Hence, demoralization becomes the most important task. How do they do it? By use stress, discord, and confusion. Now I want you to stop listening to me for a second and just go back to what you've heard on the news today, what you've seen on X, on social media, wherever you go for your information. Most likely you have experienced a high level of stress. Most likely you have experienced or read about some discord. And most likely you are to a certain degree confused. This is not just happening. This was engineered and this is aimed to undermine our society, to change our political landscape. And repeating one more time, the main goal of combat propaganda is demoralization because it leads to the weakening of the adversary. And in this case, in the hybrid war with the Kremlin, we are the enemy. So they are trying to demoralize us. So how do they do it? They are altering our behavioral patterns. How do they do it? They use brainwashing techniques based on physiological factors. We'll look into it in a second. What does it mean? The atmosphere of danger incites fear and leads to stress. And here, again, the television, the, your feed on social media becomes a weapon because that's where you get all the fearful messages about all the catastrophes in the world. And that's why you start feeling stressed. How is it achieved? Through the continual flow of engineered myths and narratives. And you might ask, how can words and images become physical? Uh, I'm talking about physiological uh, mechanism, right? How can it be? Well, here's a very simple example. When many of you probably have experienced uh, a situation when somebody tells you a story so horrible that your hair stands on end, right? Or you have in goosebumps. This is a physical description. It's hair trigger, autonomic nervous systems uh, response. It generates rapid and elevated response to aversive stimuli. So here we have the illustration how word or image becomes a trigger, a symbol or a sign leads to physiological reaction. Physiological reaction then leads to a physical act because most likely when you experience a strong reaction, you will be willing to act. Whether it's picking up the uh, phone to call your friends or family and share the horrid news, or whether you are uh, inclined or having an urge to post on Facebook or Twitter or TikTok, wherever you're posting about it, sharing, it leads to action. Now, Apply it to the election situation. You hear or see something, you experience in a strong emotion, and then you act, you vote based on the words or images that were planted in your subconscious. That is a very serious situation, and very few people actually think about it. So how is language being weaponized? It is weaponized because words are emotional. So the political technologists use your emotions. 
human emotions encompasses a wide array of discrete affective states. I like this definition. And that includes fear, anger, sadness, happiness. And each of these affective states activates unique neurophysiological pathways and politically relevant issue attitudes. What does it mean in other words? Each of your reaction will lead to an action. And this action eventually of each individual brought together will change our collective situation. That's how it works. So here's a little simplified illustration to it. We perceive danger while we're watching catastrophes, we're watching um, something about a new pandemic coming or about a tsunami or a flood or a storm right now, right? Somewhere in the States or about the war and the new attack by the Russians um, on Ukraine for Ukrainians. And we perceive danger. And this leads to stress and trauma. And stress and trauma lead to PTSD, post-traumatic uh, syndrome. And that in turn leads to the changes in the brain because PTSD symptoms are associated with adverse changes in the structure and function of the brain. To put it more simply, the critical thinking capacity is diminished or sometimes is no more because the part of the brain responsible for, crit think for critical thinking is not functioning. And here we make this connection. We see how PTSD related effects on the brain can be achieved by using mass media. If somebody is watching uh, 24 seven um, news, violent and graphic images, that will lead to the same type of PTSD as soldiers on the battlefield experience. Uh, there were quite a few of studies conducted. Here's a quote from one of them. A viewing violent news events via social media can cause people to experience symptoms similar to PTSD caused by the actual events. And that's how the political technologies get to your mind. They are creating stress situation using media. Uh, there are a couple of good quotes here, that there is mountain evidence that live and video images of traumatic events can trigger flashbacks and encourage fear conditioning. If repeatedly viewing traumatic images reactivates fear, or threat responses in the brain and promotes rumination, there could be serious health consequences. And what's important for us, the diminished ability to think critically. And prolonged media exposure can turn what was an acute experience into a chronic form of stress. So imagine, think about it now, that all the news um, and the news cycle that we have been watching for the last few years, starting with the Trump uh, coming, um, becoming the president of the United States, which caused a lot of stress in uh, many uh, in the United States, and to the COVID pandemic all around the world, and then multiple wars starting in 2022, 2023, and uh, until now. Uh, th this is a very stressful situation. Uh, if you watch the news all the time, there's a chronic form of stress. So let's review it quickly. Stress as a method. Propagandists create stress because not all news that you watch reflecting the facts. A lot of those news would be fabricated, especially if you're watching the Russian made news. For people who are still watching RT, Russia Today or Sputnik, or a lot of the affiliates or a lot of the channels that parrot the Russian propaganda, 
would be exposed to the high level of stress. And very often when, when we are on YouTube, we do not know where the news uh, is coming from, who is behind the channel. And so we can become exposed to this ongoing flow of stress. And the situation is then perceived as vulnerable. And at this point, the propagandists on this channel you're watching will target you and offer the solutions. And by offer you the, the good, feel good uh, experience, they will earn the trust. After which offering the narratives that are useful for them would be easy. They will be working on you. One of the interesting uh, side effects here, and I don't have a lot of time to go into that, but it's worth mentioning that by exposing people to fear, uh, propagandists can turn liberals to conservatives. If you become frightened of mobs of rapists and criminals flooding your state, you're more likely to start thinking more conservatively if you are afraid for your family, say. And the, uh, multiple studies confirm that. So just to finish up with the stress method, because it's one of the most important things from this talk, that political technologies instill fear and produce stress. This leads to changes in collective and individual behavioral patterns. PTSD symptoms experience then create trust and identif identification with the aggressor and promote conservative thinking. And political technologies then accept their narratives, their myths, and they change the political landscape. As collective mind changes, the society is changed too. And this is what we are observing right now in our information uh, filled information space. And that's what we hope we will not uh, experience as the result of this um, information warfare uh, offensive. Here are a few more things that are important. Uh, miss as a weapon, language as a weapon. Why is it possible? It is possible because people think in words, images, and stories. And myths thus become a major weapon, and they're used by the combat propagandists. Uh, and languages are the building blocks of the myths, and language thus becomes a weapon and a tool. Uh, so here I will not go through many and many of uh, tactics of combat propaganda. We switch in from the general main method and strategy to the tactics, which some of you will recognize because you've seen it and you've seen it again and again on social media and in mass media. Uh, we'll just go through the most common one. And if you want to know more, um, you can find more even on my Twitter. I recently reposted the whole uh, thread with every uh, method explained, every tactic explained, and with a link to the article in Byline Times, where you'll find even more details and even more examples. Uh, rotten herring or smear campaign, very important. Uh, a good illustration is uh, Hillary Clinton and her emails or the pizza gate uh, when nobody knew exactly what was in her emails, but there was a miscreated of something done wrong and nobody exactly knew what was done wrong. And it didn't matter because there was a shadow cast by this miss at the person who was targeted. And so did the pizza gate. And, um, as a result, there was a smear campaign. Why is it called rotten herring? Because rotten herring, if rubbed on, on an object, on a person, will linger. The, the smell of the rotten herring will linger. And that's what this tactic is after, to, to leave this 
uh, smell, so to say, in your subconscious. So you don't know exactly what you don't like, but you heard quite a bit, oh, I just don't like her. And that that's the result of this campaign. Another one is a big lie. Uh, I'm not going to go into it now. It's basically the same, but in, on a bigger scale. Very important one is 4060. And uh, here's a slide on it. Uh, say uh, RT, which formerly was Russia today, uh, as an example, wrote about topics that um, American media wouldn't cover at the time. Um, so say it was a while ago, but many of you will remember Occupy Wall Street movement. And so by doing that, by covering positively this movement, uh, RT warned the trust of American liberals and young people, sometimes now referred to as tankies too. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, it was actually, uh, first invented by Goebbels and 40% uh, of the information that the channel will provide will be based on facts or 60% rather will be based on facts. So they gain your trust. You see that, oh, well, you see th this is really the, the right situation. They're telling us the truth. And then when the trust is created, there will be an informational dump and about 40% or 20%, the uh, numbers can vary, will be the narrative that the propagandist uh, needs. Um, so deflection is a very important progressively so tactic. Uh, it's attention switch. Uh, or distraction, simply put, uh, when something will be dumped into the informational space uh, and it would be something very triggering for the society, people will discuss it uh, and they will not pay attention to something important happening in its shadow. Uh, so basically, whenever there is a big scandal happening, watch for something else uh, happening in the background. Uh, a, a good example for now, right now, there's in the uh, Russian and Ukrainian uh, information space, there's this overwhelming discussion of a film uh, uh, based on a novel. And the proportion is completely out of whack because there's a war going on, there's mobilization, there are thousands of deaths Meanwhile, everybody is engaged in heated discussion of a film. That is a perfect example of uh, distraction or deflection. The focus is switched. And uh, there's another tactic called whataboutism, and it uses pretty much the same mechanism. And um, that's an old Soviet tactic, as most of these tactics are. Uh, and it's, you can also call it as a false equivalences, intentional destruction. You see it on Twitter X all the time. Uh, you will post something uh, about, I don't know, let's take some neutral example. I went to the store uh, and I bought some milk and some troll will ask, yeah, but you didn't buy any beer, did you? And you wouldn't know why is he talking about beer, but that's because they don't want you to, to talk about milk. And obviously this situation doesn't happen very much in the grocery shopping, but it happens all the time uh, in the political discussions. Uh, for instance, when you say uh, something uh, like, the. Russia is uh, right now in the midst of the hybrid war and is the Kremlin is attacking the Western democracy. And somebody will write down, oh, look at the United States and um, the colonial states of the Great Britain and they can go into history and they will completely distract you from your point and from the Kremlin attack on democracy because you will then be answering, hopefully not, uh, but you will be uh, wanting to address that fact or the distortion of fact. And as a result, it doesn't matter whether the fact is true or not. They will sway you from your subject. So it's another miscreating tool. Um, 
And so here are some examples. We may be bad, but others are just as bad. The annexation of Crimea was just like the invasion of Iraq. Or Trump once said a few years ago, Putin is a killer, but in the US, they kill people too. That's a classic whataboutism. Uh, how do you address it? Do not respond. Do not get involved. Uh, just stay on the subject and might advice block this person who posted what about his comment. Uh, there are other um, techniques. I'm not going to go uh, into them right now, uh, into all of them, but this is important. Uh, facts versus emotions, very, very important because the propagandists would be drowning facts with emotion. They will be appealing to your emotion. Uh, the story will be presented in such an emotional way and using such emotional language that the facts will lose their importance. Uh, very briefly, an example, in 2016, I believe, or maybe 15, uh, there was a, a famous or infamous rather Lisa case in Germany in which Muslim immigrants were accused of sexually assaulted a Russian immigrant girl. Uh, it was entirely fabricated, uh, but the uh, local uh, Russian speaking community were so overwhelmed that nobody paid any attention to facts. And there were multiple uh, demonstrations, protests, revolts, and they led to further discord in the German society. Unfortunately, we were don't have time to cover everything here, the mechanics uh, of the misspreading. Um, very briefly on the manipulation of senses, everything will be weaponized, weaponized, your vision, your hearing, smell, taste, touch. I have some visual uh, examples. Um, red, purple, orange, speed up breathing and heart rates. So if you see a lot of that, that is probably there uh, for a reason if it's used by the Kremlin propaganda channels, that is, um, their different colors have different uh, effect, effect on uh, senses. Uh, even smell and taste would be used, uh, say for the immigrant communities, um, the exposure to propaganda channels in a grocery store, in an ethnic grocery store, will create the positive association. Here you see uh, a photo of a uh, large screen television in a Russian grocery store where all the comfort foods are being sold and RT is playing some kind of reception in the Kremlin in the background. Music would have the same effect. This nostalgia would be weaponized and used uh, to say convert people to vote a certain way. Uh, touch and association is also are uh, also uh, a, a part of the mechanism. Here you see dictators holding kittens, furry animals, and kids. Uh, that's because on the immediate level, subconscious level, a positive association is created, kittens, kids, uh, and in one of the cases, a furry koala. Uh, sounds, of course, are also weaponized, uh, and this is as old as this world, not invented by the Russians, but the drums and chanting were used by shamans in the religious brainwashing. The Nazis used it, the Soviets used it, and uh, the Russians use it now. Here you see on the left, the torches march with chanting in Charlottesville. On the right, you see the Red Square. Of course, you, you can ask me, what about the fireworks on the 4th of July? Well, there could be innocent use of all of the above. Um, all of these methods become propagandists where the political engineers, political technologies use it to engineer certain results. Uh, here you see the totally ridiculous scent, smell like Putin here. That's of course in Russian, but it was imported as well. And here's the Putin jacket, which also was selling as a brand. So Putin as a brand is an interesting uh, subject at the time when they were still trying to create the positive image of Putin. And the language, when you will read a text composed by a political 
um, technologies, there will be a lot of emotive words. Like in this text, in bold, you can just see danger, war, dirty, concentration camps, fascists. And this text is targeting the Jewish segment uh, of um, uh, immigrant population in the United States. And it is designed to create the negative image uh, of the liberals. So what is the goal of that? The goal is to plant discord in the society. Why? In order to divide and rule. Again, Putin didn't invent it. The Russians didn't invent it. It's as old as the world. And uh, what they do, they distort the reality uh, and they use the existing vocabulary and the emotional arsenal so they can create the new language and divide and rule the targeted society. Um, there is a, a Kremlin uh, ideologist, so-called quote-unquote philosopher, Alexander Dugin, who spoke and wrote about it in his 40-year career at length. Uh, he spoke a lot about divide and conquer, basically openly speaking about uh, introducing geopolitical, geopolitical disorder into American society. And to my horror, a week ago, I opened Twitter and I saw there was a Twitter space with Alexander Dugan speaking to the audience of about 300 people in English, so in Discord. So it's all very much there, uh, even though uh, it existed for decades, uh, were called active measures um, in the Soviet Union. And uh, ever since then, the Kremlin was funding, cultivating, supporting, nurturing separatist movement, um, terrorist movement, political parties. Uh, and uh, here we have what is known as a horseshoe, sorry, the <laughs> horseshoe effect, Theory. far left Horse to far right, the nationalistic movements in the US and Europe are supported by the Kremlin. Uh, so by doing this, they're inciting the social and religious conflicts. Why? Again, to divide and conquer. And they will not come up with their own topics. They will use the existing ones. Uh, the political technologists study the societies, the states of adversary, and come up with the perfect topics to hijack. And it could be anything from Black Lives Matter uh, to feminism to homophobia, uh, generational gender uh, issues, not necessarily even conflicts, authentic movements, um, they all will be weaponized. So when you come up with this argument, oftentimes somebody will tell you, oh, are you talking about racism in America? Putin didn't invent it. No, exactly right. Putin or the Kremlin did not invent it. They use it to uh, cause the discord in the society. And minority groups are very vulnerable to this. They're easy manipulated uh, because they are experiencing or perceive the environment as discriminating. Uh, so, uh, of course, the goal here is to deepen the existing differences, uh, saw discord and confusion. The long-term goal here to use discontent in order to form the fifth column, quote unquote, so internal enemy. And we saw that and we still see that when uh, politicians and uh, various uh, movement activists are speaking about Russia as the United States friend and so forth. This is a pretty horrifying uh, quote uh, page of definitions on every ethnic group from the uh, manual where each ethnicity is described having positive and negative qualities that are learned by heart and then used when cre when the tags targeting them or memes targeting them are created. Uh, 
And uh, here's an example of funding the opposition parties. By now, it's a well-known fact. Marie Le Pen's party was funded by the Kremlin. Uh, of course, religion is being used. Um, and uh, as I've mentioned, support of opposition groups. The photograph you have here on your screen um, are the posters that I personally took photo of in 2015 in San Francisco. Uh, Putin is your friend, Wall Street is finished. It's been going on for a long time, friends. Um, so the end goal is creating confusion. So individuals and society as a whole have lost the ability to think independently, think critically. The reality is fused with the myths uh, and so-called post-truth is created or simply put the truth, the facts are eliminating and the fake news uh, flooding the information space. Uh, and this is again the post-truth, I'm gonna skip this quote. Um, there are plenty of, of various channels. These days, RT has been mainly banned in the United States, but not in Europe. Uh, and um, now they're more clandestine, and there are a lot of sources that you will not recognize, but they are out there. What do they use? They use social media, a communal dream space. Here I'm quoting the Inception film again, the interconnected dream worlds into which the narratives are infused, and thus these dream spaces changed and become our realities. They use bots and trolls to do it, our last section, what to do? Because by now, if you were listening to me, if you were listening carefully, if you were thinking critically, questioning a lot, fair enough, one of the main questions for you is, what do we do? How do we confront it? Well, first of all, I would say, it's be aware of the situation. Be aware and don't take my word for, gran for granted. Do your own research. Look for the hybrid war documents, reports. Um, look for the information on disinformation. Educate yourself. Oops. Um, a fundamental principle of countering these narratives to remember this is about our way of living. This is about our democracy because I lived in a totalitarian state and so did Ukraine. That's why Ukraine is fighting so fiercely not to be consumed by the totalitarian society again because there is no air, no space to breathe in a totalitarian society. That's the government that makes you slave as a child uh, collecting uh, rotten carrots in the field and you cannot do anything. This is a society that makes you study propaganda when you want to study literature. There's no freedom there. So we need to retain our democracy imperfect as it is. How do we do it? Uh, well, to confront it, when if you want to uh, have a word duel with somebody who is so in propaganda, it's important to remember that just simply delivering truth and facts will not work because as you remember and hopefully learned by now the part of the brain has been changed the behavior patterns are changed and if you attack somebody's personal views that will lead to more resistance and that will strengthen the beliefs in question so what we can do we can forewarn we can deliver the information about the Russian propaganda, whatever the channels are still there, about the Russian society now, in order to prevent young people on TikTok, say, from being brainwashed, or to prevent societies who know less about uh, these uh, conditions, about this situation. Say, Latin America is being targeted uh, by the Russian propagandists very heavily. So is Africa, Australia, New Zealand. Forewarning is very important. And focusing on positive 
and the Western values, creative our own positive narrative is really, really important. So it's the individual freedom of speech and will, the importance of human life versus the collective goals and ideas. Very, very important. What do you do as a person on a personal level, personal defense? Whenever you read something that makes your heart beat faster, stop, breathe, calm down. Do not respond on impulse. Do not act right away. First, retain your ability to think critically. Think about it. Just wait on it. Check sources. Think again, I cannot say it enough. Think, 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 analyze, and only then act. Uh, personal defense again, remembering that they want you demoralized. They want you to be stressed. So another way to avoid it is turn into something that makes you feel better. Educating yourself by reading history, philosophy, literature, turn into art is good. But even just going into the nature, to spending time with family, friends, uh, be, staying fit and healthy through exercise, cell care, relaxation, these are actually weapons to confront this uh, attack on us because you will be able to think critically better. And uh, another one of the last things, try to stay tolerant, try not to immediately fight because they want us to fight. They want us to be aggressive. They want to divide and conquer. They want to break us into groups and they want us to attack each other and basically defeat uh, our society within our society. So they don't have anything to do with it. So stay polite. Ask to be polite. If you detest somebody's point of view, there's always a block option as well. And um, here we come to the Q&A. Serena, thank you so much for that. It's not lost on me that you are reporting this very important information from a war zone. And this is something that we are going to get out to our viewers as quickly as possible. I know that you have to go and we have... Uh, uh, an urgency to get this material out. I just want to say that I've always known that MAGA was active measures. I'm 100% sure now because a former Trump supporter told me and Jim and Hi-Fi that he was in trauma, desperation, and panic for years. That was the, that was the mindset. Trauma, desperation, panic. I can now see absolutely 100% this is active measures and uh, I cannot thank you enough. I have a couple of comments. I'm sure Jim and Hi-Fi do too. Jim, you wanna uh, go yeah, ahead? Yeah, I, uh, I, I actually don't have any questions at all because that was one of the most important things I've ever heard in my life and I need people to hear it very clearly. Uh, the only thing I wanna do is emphasize to our audience and anyone else who might see this, you're listening to someone who was there, who was taught these methods against us a long time ago. Um, and, and this is real. What Zarina is describing is obviously happening in Russia. It's obviously happening in Ukraine and it could not be more obvious that it's happening here. And what, what she said about um, arming yourself and defending yourself, defend the people around you by sharing this information with them. That's all I have to say. Zarina, you're a, you're, you're a treasure and I'm, I'm grateful to, to have you here. Thank you. High five. I nailed it. Nailed. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I, the, the last thing I want to say, then I want Serena to have the final word. When you talk about the Kremlin launching a myth, I, I hear that as Kremlin's launching a missile to our brains. And we have to be aware and we have to be vigilant. And Serena gave us the solutions as, as well as laying out this complex and yet somewhat simple uh, 
you know, uh, met methodology. Zarina, final word on the psychosphere and how we can wake Americans and the West up that we are under attack. We've been under attack for a long time. Our minds are the battleground. And, you know, how, how can we just urgently get this message out? This tutorial is going to go a long way, but if you have one line that can wake people up on the importance of sharing this tutorial, please. Yes, thank you, Heidi and Josh and Jim. A um, couple of things here, um, and then a technical note on resources. So one, um, there is one good metaphor that I came up years ago, and that's from the natural world. Um, there are types of insects that inject poison inside of different species uh, to paralyze that target and to either lay eggs in it or just to made it their own, basically like alien film. And so what we have here, we have um, a red wasp injecting poison into a spider and the spider still walks, acts, but it is not a spider, inside is empty, it's all red wasp. And that's scary as it is, and I'm sorry, but that's what the mind war is about. There's no better description. And the second thing, when I started to teach it, I never used it. I never worked for the Russian or Soviet government. I ran away from there as soon as I could. I lived most of my life. Oh, there's an explosion outside. I lived most of my life uh, in the United States, which is my home, my language is really English. I write in English. All of my books published are in English. It's an actual uh, conscious choice. I chose the United States as my country. I chose English as my language. There's another explosion. Uh, and uh, I started to teach it, not because I wanted to, I was just want, wanting to write my novels. To, all my life, I only loved literature. But I had to because I noticed that they started to do it. And I was one of the few who could recognize it and do it in the Western society. And so I was doing it. And people were telling me, you lost your mind. You are crazy. You belong in the mental institution. And now... I am teaching it again from the war zone where I hear, as I speak, artillery fire, where yesterday the aerial bomb landed in the historical center, where people are killed on daily basis, civilians. My main desire is not to teach this hybrid war course from war zone to war zone. I don't want my home, the United States of America, to become a war zone as this beautiful country, the home of my ancestors became, and it's being torn by the same enemy. And therefore, emotional as it is, I try to stay very cold and rational throughout the presentation, but I'm not, I can't be. My whole life, just as the life of this country was broken by these, creatures and I don't want them to break the United States of America. I don't want them to break Europe. I don't want them to break the Great Britain. So if you are there, please take it seriously. It took most of my life. I don't want you to suffer and your children to suffer from the same. Be aware, don't take my words again for granted check everything, fact check everything. Don't trust me either. Don't, you know, just rely on your own thinking capacity. Go there, do your diligence, do your work, be aware, don't emote and know that you are under attack by an aggressor. Technical note. I've been teaching it for years, so you can find a lot of written material with examples on my Medium blog, uh, Zarina Zabriski on Medium, a lot of articles on our excellent Byline Times um, newspaper, 
and website. I started to write for them before they became the newspaper. It was still a website. And um, on YouTube channel, there is a um, channel called Russian Propaganda Explained Seminars. And there are a few of these seminars that I taught in San Francisco, New York, someplace else. Serena Zabriskie, thank you so much. We are much better informed and um, I feel a very profound urgency to get this out as soon as possible. Thank you. I really appreciate you fighting this fight with me. It, 